So we've been talking about uh, the basics of Buddhism, and we started with the story of the Buddha search for a way to transcend stress, and uh, then the Four Noble Truths, and the last of the Four Noble Truths is the Eightfold Path. And so we're going to go into the second section of the Eightfold Path. And we're using, in Theravada Buddhism, they talk about the Eightfold Path as a triple training. That's the term they use, trisika. And uh, so it breaks down into cultivating sila, or uh, ethical restraint, samadhi, training the mind, and then panya, wisdom. So we're going to talk about samadhi tonight, the second of these. And it's the, uh, uh, the last three factors of the Eightfold Path. So, <clears throat> you know, last week we talked about Sila. And it's possible that some of you thought after the talk, well, maybe I should go and try some of this. You know, set my mind on living more compassionately or something like that. If you did that, you probably learned quite a bit. When you do that sort of thing, you learn that you have patterns of causing harm that you don't even think about hardly until you try not to do them. And you probably learned something about how hard it is to let go of these patterns. And so you experience some of the turmoil that goes on in your mind about that sort of thing. Uh, and I would say that if you spent a week really working on one of the factors of sila that you have difficulty with, like, you know, if you work in an environment where people gossip a lot or something, and say I'm going to refrain from that, that harmful speech for a week. You probably learn more about Buddhist practice from trying to refrain from something you have difficulty with for a week than you would for listening to me talk for months, honestly. It's when you try to put these things into practice in those areas where you have difficulty, where you experience stress, where you're creating suffering for yourself and others, that you really start to learn how the practice bears fruit. And you learn how doing these things cause you to experience a little bit less stress. So I mention this because as we're going into the second triple, the part of the triple training, uh, that where we deal with meditation and kind of related topics. And there's a couple things that I want you to keep in mind as we go through this. And the first is that I could talk about meditation for weeks and weeks. In fact, I spend a lot of time talking about meditation. Um, but you'll learn more from actually training your mind than from any amount of listening to me or anyone else or reading books or downloading Dharma talks or anything. Hearing about it is not doing it. It's hearing about it is not knowing about it. You have to put it into practice. And the second thing to think about is that we don't practice meditation and mindfulness so that when we come here to meditate, we'll be good at it. Or so that when we go to retreats, you know, we'll, we'll look like we know what we're doing. We practice meditation and mindfulness so that we can live mindfully. And we live mindfully so that we can transcend, get out of the cycle of stress that we're in. So, we want to end all those things that the first noble truth talks about. First, you know, the, the stress of birth and death and illness and old age and pain, lamentation, sorrow and despair, all those stuff, that, things that the Buddha said we want to, is in the first noble truth. The, the cessation of those things is why we're doing this. So, uh, we call this second section samadhi, which basically translates more or less as concentration. But as I'm going to talk about it tonight, and as it, the Buddha talks about it in uh, the sutra where he analyzes the path, we're focusing mainly on, on meditation-related topics. They spill over into all other areas of your practice. But I'm going to try to do this in about 15 minutes. <laughs> so. We're not even going to get all the way through its effect on meditation, but that's where we're going to approach it. So here's how the Buddha... So there's three, three parts of this, the last three factors of the Eightfold Path. Right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So here's how the Buddha explained right effort. 
says, there is the case where a monk generates desire, endeavors, activates persistence, upholds and exerts his intent for the sake of the non-arising of evil, unskillful qualities that have not yet arisen. And then he generates desire, etc., etc., for the sake of the abandonment of evil, unskillful qualities that have arisen. He generates desire, etc., for the sake of arising of, uns of skillful qualities that have not yet arisen and he generates desire and so on for the maintenance, non-confusion, increase, plenitude, development, and culmination of skillful qualities that have arisen. This is right effort. So let me unpack this a little bit. So first, look at how he describes what he means by effort. Generating the desire for something. Remember, the second noble truth is that the cause of stress is desire but it's desire for things that cause stress. <laughs> Here we're generating a desire for something that transcends stress. So we're generating the desire, persisting, upholding and exerting our intent. So in other words, I want to do this. I'm putting my energy into doing it, okay? And then he says that there's four right things to put your energy into to keep unskillful qualities from arising. And we're talking, when we're talking about meditation, things like that, we mean unskillful mental qualities. To abandon these unskillful qualities that have arisen. And then to cultivate skillful mental qualities that have not yet arisen and maintain those that are present. So, again, this doesn't mean just in meditation. If you're a gambler, you know, that craving for that excitement or that addiction to gambling would be an unskillful mental quality. But in general, we can look, if when we talk about unskillful mental qualities, a good place to start looking is at the five hindrances. These are hindrances to meditation, they're hindrances to spiritual progress, they're hindrances in our life. When we meditate, we can look pretty specifically for these things, which are sensual desire, in other words, desire for things that actually will lead us away from spiritual progress and away from our goal in meditation, which is to calm the mind. Okay. Anger and ill will. Uh, restlessness and, and anxiety. Kind of the opposite of that. It's usually translated as sloth and torpor. Think of being kind of sleepy, fuzzy-headed, or being lazy about it. I don't feel like meditating. I'd rather read a book or take a nap. <clears throat> and then doubt. And by doubt, I don't mean skepticism. I mean the kind of doubt that will derail your practice. And then as for skillful qualities, there's quite a few of them. Uh, you might look at the five spiritual powers. Faith, uh, wisdom, energy, concentration, mindfulness. And you might look at the four Brahma Viharas. These are good things to focus on in meditation too. Goodwill, the desire for happiness for yourself and others. Compassion, the desire to help others be free from suffering. Things like gratitude, equanimity. So these are the kind of states of mind that you want to be aware of when they're there and you want to maintain them when they're, they arise. And if they're not there, you want to know that and you want to cause them to arise. So, the next factor then, and this is kind of how you do this. You know, the main objective is to abandon unskillful mental qualities and cultivate and maintain skillful mental qualities. And so you do this through mindfulness and concentration, largely. So, Mindfulness, and this is a word that gets kicked around a lot in Buddhism, has a lot of different meanings in a lot of different contexts. And we'll talk about it more a little bit later on in a few weeks. We'll, we'll spend some time on mindfulness. But right now we'll focus on what the Buddha said when, in his analysis of the path. He said, there's the case where a monk remains focused on the body and in of itself, ardent, aware, and mindful putting away greed and distress with reference to the world. He remains focused on feelings in and of themselves. He remains focused on mind in and of itself. 
He remains focused on mental qualities in and of themselves. And all of this, ardent, aware, mindful, putting away greed and distress with reference to the world. So, <clears throat> he ta he's talking here about uh, the four foundations of the four establishings of mindfulness. And there's a, a very long, complicated sutra where he goes through this in great detail, and we'll probably talk about that uh, in a few weeks too. But thinking about that in terms of tonight, when you meditate, for example, the word the Buddha used for mindfulness is a Pali word, sati, S-A-T-I. And it really means kind of to remember or to keep in mind. So what are you keeping in mind? Well, if you're, if you're meditating on your breath, you're remembering to keep your breath in mind. Remembering to keep your attention there. If you're looking at these four foundations of mindfulness, you see that there's mindfulness with regards to what's happening in the body. Breath is in the body. So that's you know, this, this first establishing of mindfulness. If you're meditating on your breath, you're meditating on something that's happening in your body. And then the second thing is feeling. In other words, I have a sensation. Is it a pleasant sensation, an unpleasant sensation, or a neutral sensation? Mind. What is my mind doing? What's happening in my mind right now? Where is it going? Where is my attention going? All those things. Observing the mind itself. And then mental states. Again, is, is loving kindness present? Is concentration present? Is serenity present? Those things. What's, is anger present? Is restlessness present? All those kinds of things. We're, we're actually meditating. Our object of meditation there, our object of mindfulness, is you know, what state the mind is in. So... <clears throat> Notice this instruction, ardent, alert, or ardent, aware, and mindful. So you're focused on the body. You, you put your intention on this. I, I'm going to sit down and meditate tonight. I'm going to meditate on my breath. I'm going to pay really close attention to whether or not I'm meditating on my breath. I'm going to remain very watchful of what I'm doing while I'm meditating. If my, if my attention wanders away from the breath, I'm going to notice this. So, I really want to do this. I'm setting my mind on doing it and I'm paying attention to whether or not I'm doing it and, and constantly bringing myself back to my goal. Okay. The other part of this instruction is putting away greed and distress with reference to the world. Okay. In other words, meditating on your breath in a way that you... Um, you're not attaching to things. You're not chasing after every little thing that comes up in your mind or running away from anything that comes up in your mind. If you have an unpleasant sensation, it's just an unpleasant <coughs> sensation. It's not something you've got to do anything with. If a pleasant thing arises, you don't have to attach to that or cling to that. If an interesting thought comes up, you don't have to go running after it. Okay. Being the, the sort of being in the moment part of this is if you keep coming back to the experience of what's happening right now, then you're not running forward into the future or running away from the past or worrying about what's going to happen or any of that kind of stuff. So that's putting away greed and reference with respect to the world. What's happening right now? What's actually going on in this moment? And staying alert to that rather than being pulled off in different directions. And then the final a uh, factor of this is concentration, right concentration. And it's very interesting what the Buddha says about right concentration in this context. Now again, we'll talk about concentration in other contexts later, but for right now, thinking about it in terms of meditation, he says, there's a case for a monk quite withdrawn from sensuality, from unskillful mental qualities, enters and remains in the first jhana. Rapture and pleasure born from withdrawal accompanied by directed thought and evaluation. So there's some big words here. Jhana, meditative absorption. I have set my mind on my 
breath, probably, or whatever your meditation object happens to be. And because you've withdrawn from <clears throat> these things that are drawing you in different directions, and because you've stopped letting your mind get stirred up by stuff that happens, because of your mindfulness, your ardency or alertness, uh, you're, you become absorbed into your meditation object. And when that happens, when you stop creating a lot of stress for yourself, you get feelings of, of pleasure. It feels good to do this. Uh, accompanied by directed thought and evaluation. In other words, you haven't stopped thinking. You haven't stopped in, involving that, that thinking part of your mind and what's going on. And a lot of people think, well, when I sit down to meditate, if a thought comes up, that's bad. Or I should just stop all my thoughts altogether or whatever. You can notice I have a sensation. That's a thought. You haven't suspended all those things yet, but you're directing your thought. You're not drifting around wherever it goes. You're bringing your thoughts back to your object of meditation. And evaluation. Am I comfortable? Am I breathing comfortably? Am I tight somewhere? You know, does my breath come and go freely? Is loving kindness present in my heart? You know, and all of those things, you're, you're evaluating what's happening. You're not judging yourself for it. And this is one of the things that comes up a lot, is that, you know, you'll get hear Dharma teachers that say, oh, well, we don't judge anything. No, we don't judge. If a, if a sensation comes up and it's uncomfortable, we don't freak out and go, oh, I'm such a bad meditator because I've got this sensation that's happening that always comes up when I meditate. We don't say, this is a bad experience, I'm having a lousy meditation, anything like that. But we do evaluate the activity of our mind and whether or not it's going where we want to go with it. Okay. So that's the first jhana. <laughs> then with the stilling of directed thoughts and evaluations, he enters and remains in the second jhana. So in other words, eventually your absorption becomes refined enough that you don't have to direct or evaluate anything anymore. It's just there. Uh, <clears throat> with the fading of rapture, he remains equanimous. So this will happen to you eventually over time as you meditate. You'll find these more refined mental states. At first they're very blissful. And then you go beyond that. And here's a kind of key thing too that whole thing about mindful, not uh, you know, putting aside greed and, greed and distress with reference to the world. Well, we don't want to attach to these blissful states that come up either. And we'll stay with our object of, of concentration because the blissful state will pass, your concentration becomes more refined, your thoughts become even calmer, and you end up in a state of equanimity and then eventually abandon pleasure and pain. So as with the earlier disappearance of elation and distress, he enters and remains in the fourth jhana, purity of equanimity and mindfulness, neither pleasure nor pain. This, monks, is called right concentration. So if you're doing concentration meditation, that's where you want to be trying to head with this. You don't have to do this in order to get some insight. You don't have to get to that point in order to get a lot of benefit from meditation. But this is where, kind of where you're heading with, with meditation. It's very much more refined states of mind during meditation. So, my last word on, on meditation for tonight, and then we'll meditate. Uh, meditation is work. You know, it's a, it's a developed skill. It's something you've got to work at. So don't always expect it to be peaceful. Don't expect to fall right straight into jhana. Don't expect any of those things. The best way to go into meditation is with no expectations whatsoever. Simply sit down and say, I'm going to concentrate on my breath or whatever else you happen to do. Um, there are countless ways to meditate even in Buddhism alone, and there's a bunch of other ways to meditate too. But if you look at instructions the Buddha gave for meditation, there's a wide spectrum of things. Uh, 
the one that everybody comes back to, and everybody starts out with meditating on your breath, that's probably the one that you'll get the most benefit from over the longest period of time. But, as is pointed out <coughs> in here, there's a lot of work to be done getting rid of thoughts and mental states that take you into harmful places, cultivating mental states that increase your peacefulness and your ability to relate to others. So, uh, you know, don't, ex don't think there's only one thing to do. Uh, <coughs> there's a whole, you know, world that goes on out there just under these three factors. So, all right, so let's meditate.